Hey, welcome back everybody. Uh, I hope you had a restorative break. We are going to talk about the next section now, which I'm going to call the basics or the quantum facts of life. So it's just a recap from the previous section. We already discussed superposition and the block sphere, remember? So just as a quick overview, the block sphere is this three-dimensional sphere. The two states on the north and the south pole refer to the zero state and the one state, and then a superposition is a vector that points to anywhere on the surface of the sphere, and that represents a combination of the two states. It's a little bit of one and a little bit of zero with a normalization factor out front. And that's normally how we, we define a superposition. Until measurement, of course, forces it to be one or the other state as well. What we haven't discussed yet is the idea of quantum entanglement, which is yet another quantum phenomenon. So if I have two particles that are each in a superposition, and then I somehow mysteriously entangle them together, and it's not really important for this conversation how that happens, but I entangle them together and shoot them somehow to the ends of the Earth, and then I observe one and note it to be zero. That's what I'm representing here with that little eyeball. That means that automatically the other qubit is in one state, even before I were to go and measure it. You will never find it not in that one state. So the properties between these two qubits are shared when they are entangled, and neither qubit's state can be completely described independently of one another. And this is the symbol that we will use to, to describe this. This would be an entangled state. And another way of noting this is a uh, tensor product, and we'll talk about that later on as well. So as a quick review to make sure we are all on the same page, I just want to pause here and take a step back and make sure that we are not getting into anything too mathematical before we are all in the same playing field. So complex numbers are at front and center and at the heart of quantum mechanics. A complex number can be written as its real component plus i times its imaginary component, where i is obviously the square root of negative 1. Um, you can visualize this in the complex space where the axes are real and imaginary, like so, where this point would represent the fully complex number. We can also write it in terms of its polar coordinates, making special note of one of the most powerful equations in all of physics and math, Euler's equation which says that e to the i theta is equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta. If we were to rewrite our complex number in terms of the polar coordinates, we would find that we can factor out this e to the i theta exponential, plug in what Euler's equation tells us, and then see that the uh, terms for the real and the imaginary component would be r cosine theta and r sine theta. If we square all of these components now, um, the magnitude is equal to the squared value of r, which will represent the magnitude of that, in, of that number in polar coordinates, okay? All right, so in addition, we also keep using this term complex conjugates in uh, quantum mechanics and also Hermitian conjugates as well. And the definition of a complex conjugate is simply the definition of the imaginary number, but with a minus sign here in front of the y component, in front of the imaginary term instead of a plus sign. And if we were to rewrite that in polar coordinates, you would see there would be a, a negative exponential now as well. And complex conjugates are, are noted by this star symbol here. So if you look over at the graph now, where we originally had that dot representing that vector, representing the uh, the imaginary number, the complex conjugate would be its mirror rotation across that real axis there. Okay. Um, we also define in quantum mechanics and in quantum computing the norm squared, which is this uh, magnitude of the z number squared. It's z times its complex conjugate, also equal to r squared. And that will always have to be equal to the uh, 1 when we sum up all of the components of the state that we're talking about. We will also be discussing the Hermitian conjugate, which is defined as the complex transpose of a matrix. So if this is our matrix A, B, C, and D here, the Hermitian conjugate is represented by this dagger term here. So every single value in the matrix will now become its complex conjugate represented by this star here, and it's flipped across the diagonal axis. So you flip um, the, the B and the C number here. That's its Hermitian conjugate. All right, 
Now I want to dig a little bit deeper into what we refer to as a quantum state and Dirac notation as well. Dirac notation is the shorthand way of writing quantum states, which are vectors in the Hilbert space. So this is the example of a ket in bra ket notation. Did get it? Bracket, bra ket. Um, so here this psi is the uh, example of a superposition, it's not normalized right now, of the zero and the one state, where the zero can be written as a column vector of one zero, and the one ket can be written as a column vector of zero and one. Um, so this symbol of a dagger here, as we already said, is the Hermitian conjugate. This takes your ket into a bra and takes your column vector into a row vector. So you simply flip the dimensionality of the two vector states. But again, the zero is one zero, and then the one is our zero one state. Um, and as a side note, all quantum computations live as quantum states in the vector space, which we call the Hilbert space. All right, so. Uh, the combination of the bracket or the bracket is written like this. This is what we call an inner product, or you could also flip it if you are taking the uh, complex conjugate as well. So it's the same as the dot product between the two vectors. So you, if you wanted to multiply out and see what number you would get, you would simply multiply all the individual components of the vector and sum them together. So now let's just take a minute here and test our knowledge of the inner product thus far. What is the inner product of the states 0 and 1 defined as the qubit states from the previous slide? I'll give you all just a second here. Here are your definitions in, uh, in case you forgot them. All right, let's just say that's been enough time. Um, if you're not finished yet, don't worry, you'll, you'll get a shortcut answer in just a second. So when we write the zero state like this and we write the one state like this, remember we have to flip the dimensionality of the zero state because it's facing the opposite direction. It's a bra now. If we multiply this all through, you'll see that we're gonna get one times zero plus zero times one, this is zero. And this should not be surprising because zero and one are what we call orthogonal states in the vector space. They have no overlapping states. They have no overlapping components, that is. Um, okay, another important addition that we have to talk about when we talk about um, complex numbers and linear algebra is the tensor product, which can be written like this. Like I said, this little cross with a circle around it. I briefly showed you this earlier when we talked about entangled states. And if you call, it's also symbolically represented uh, like so here at the very top. So the tensor product works by multiplying each index of the matrix by the second matrix or the second vector as well. And I've written that all out for you so you can see how that might work um, in reality. So component by component, you simply multiply the first um, matrix or the first tensor, uh, the first um, column vector by the second. And so you can see here that the dimensionality grows. It doubles here because we have two column vectors that are each two by one. So the state space of the total composite physical system here is the tensor product of the state spaces of the physical components of the system. So now let's test ourselves again. Given our two qubit state, how would we write this as a tensor product? So you can do this sort of visually here, sort of by inspection. So to factor out the two states, you can see here that you're going to want to factor out one and then the other and figure out which ones you would have to multiply by component wise in order to get this final state. So this is a little bit more complicated. So I'll, I'll give you all just a minute here. Okay, 
let's say that was enough time. So what you want to do here, again, just sort of visually by inspection, is sort of pull out the first two components of the first term, which is 0 and 0, and then figure out which coefficients you can multiply together in order to get the coefficient of the first term. And you just do that across for every single component. Eventually, you'll get some that overlap, so some will be filled in for you and it becomes a little bit easier, but you can sort of just pick apart and separate these two states from one another and you can see that you will get one, which is uh, some combination of the zero and the one state cross, again, this combination of the zero and the one state, which would result in this final com combined state here. And that is how the tensor product works. All right, so let's try one more example. Let's try to find the cross product and the uh, the separable states of this two qubit state. And I'll give you all just one more minute. Uh, well, sorry to spoil the punchline here, but uh, my guess is that you're struggling a little bit and you're having some trouble uh, because this is actually impossible to do. Um, it's impossible to separate these two states because this is a description of an entangled qubit state, which by definition, cannot be separated into its individual components, right? We talked about this a few slides ago. Entangled states can only be described by the sum component of all of the different states which make up the entangled state. So you cannot separate and measure each individual qubit any longer, okay? All right. Now we're gonna talk uh, briefly about amplitudes. Quantum states are normalized and the probability is calculated by the norm squared of the amplitudes. So I remember saying on a previous slide when we first talked about the complex conjugates and the norm squared, this has to be equal to one. And so that's why a lot of the time you're gonna see when we talk about superposition states, this one over square root of two factor here, because the state has already been normalized. And if you were to go through and you were to take the norm squared or the inner product of the two psi states with itself, you would see here, uh, like on this slide, I have demonstrated that we would get um, one half plus one half, which of course is equal to one. So this is a fully normalized state, which means that the probability upon measuring the state would yield a one state or a zero state, each with a probability of one half. So one more um, test yourself. Let's figure out what the probability of measuring the one state from this specific quantum state would be. Take a minute. Okay, so hopefully that was fairly straightforward for you. If not, no problem, we're gonna walk through it. So again, if you want to <clears throat> figure out what the probability of measuring one would be, you simply want to take the complex conjugate times the original coefficient of the uh, number in front of the one state and multiply those together. And what you'll see you're gonna get is the exponential will cancel due to that imaginary term um, becoming negative. So you get e to the zero, which is one over two, which is one half. And this should not be so surprising, right? Because the coefficient in front of the zero state is the same as the previous state that I listed before, which is one over the square root of two. That means that the probability of measuring the zero state has to be one half, which means necessarily the probability of measuring the one state also has to be one half. And these exponential and this weird pi term here is just a phase that doesn't actually end up mattering when you go to make a measurement. Okay. Now let's look about how we go about changing a quantum state. You can do this by acting on the state with something called an operator, which we symbolize here as A, and often we put a little, little hat over it, which means it's a quantum operator. I'm not gonna do that throughout the rest of the slides, but just keep in mind, whenever you see a little triangle or a little hat, it means that the author is trying to tell you that it's a quantum thing. Um, operators in quantum mechanics must be equal to their own complex conjugate. Um, sometimes operators rotate a state, sometimes they move it, spin it, you get the picture. That's how we act upon a quantum state and change it. But it, it has to be equal to its own complex conjugate. 
And that's because the eigenvalues, which we'll talk about in just a second here, have to be real. And so this is another one of the most famous equations, or at least one of the most famous equation formats in physics. It's known as the eigenvector equation. And an eigenvector here represented by this state psi is acted upon this A operator. And when you act upon that A operator, assuming that the psi is in an eigenvector of that operator, you will get a value called the eigenvalue and leave the state again in the eigenvector state upon which you measured it. Um, and again, this eigenvalue has to be measurable. It has to be real. It has to be something that you can actually physically take away when you do the measurement in a laboratory. Um, conversely, just as a side, if psi is not an eigenfunction of A, then it has no specific associated eigenvalue of A, and the observable does not have a single definite value in that case. Instead, the measurements of the observable A will each yield an eigenvalue with a certain probability that's related to the decomposition of psi relative to the orthonormal eigenbasis of A. So to summarize, anything you want to measure in quantum mechanics must be a real Hermitian operator. A Hermitian operator is equal to its own complex conjugate, which is just a fancy way of saying the, the first equation here at the top. They all have real eigenvalues, which are orthogonal to one another, so they don't overlap in the vector space. And lastly, these eigenvectors will form a full basis in the vector space, meaning that you can write any state that you wish as a linear combination of the eigenvectors associated with a specific operator. Okay, so along with operators, there is another way to change our quantum state, and this is called a gate. And gates are basically an approximation to what an operator would do, but it's something that we can actually enact on the quantum computer in our laboratory. So a big series of gates would, again, approximately be equal to a theoretical operator. And a gate is a linear map of the quantum system. And linear means that it can be distributed across a state, even if it's a superposition, um, but it, it still has to be equal to that total probability of one. You can't transform it in a way that no longer makes it physical. Gates are represented, again, by matrices, which can be written as a combination of the outer products here, not the inner products. So for example, we have one of our most beloved gates here, which is the X gate. It's also known as the bit flip gate. So uh, let's take a moment here and try to work through why we call it the bit flip gate. I'm not gonna make you do it by yourselves now, but you'll see that if we act on the state zero, for example, one zero with our bit flip gate X, you can multiply this all through and what you'll actually see you get in the end is the one state. And similarly, if you were to act on the one state with the bit flip gate, the X gate, you would get the zero state. So that's why it's called the, the bit flip gate. All right, I'm gonna pause here just once again and let you try to work through the effect of what we call the Hadamard gate on the zero and the one state. So just take a moment here. Right, so if we lay out our whole equation here for you, here we have the Hadamard gate acting on the one, the zero state, sorry. What you can see here is if we multiply it all through, we get one over the square root of two for the first component, one over the square root of two for the second component. Um, and then we can write our column vector as if we factor out that one over square root of two as one, one. And if you uh, can see by inspection, this is just another way of writing the zero state as its ket plus its one state as its ket as well. So you can factor out these two states. And what you'll see is that the Hadamard gate is the gate that takes us from the state zero to a superposition state, to an equal superposition state, normalized um, with the factor of one over square root of two that we have seen on previous slides. Another important thing to note about gates in quantum is that they are unitary.
which means that if you apply them twice in a row, it's like you did nothing at all. So you end up with the identity matrix. And if we apply the identity matrix to an eigenvector, what this means is that you will still get that same eigenvector with the value of one. The eigenvalue can only be one. This is the definition of the identity matrix. It can be any, any different size. As long as you have um, one on the diagonal, it's a square matrix, we refer to the identity matrix as, as any of these. All right. Furthermore, as an example of this unitary nature, we can look at the bit flip gate, the X gate, which takes zero to one and one to zero. But if we were to apply it twice in a row, again, we would get the identity matrix because this is a quantum gate, it must be unitary. And what this means physically in the lab is we would rotate our qubit from the zero to the one state and then from the one to the zero state and leave it exactly in the state that we found it from the beginning. So this would completely undo our transformation. Now, the last way that we can transform a quantum state, which is very different than a gate or an operator, is with a measurement. And as we already saw with the double slit and the stern gerlach experiment, measurement in quantum mechanics and quantum computing is very strange. It's very weird. Measurement in classical physics has no effect on the state of the system. If you chuck a baseball and you make note of how far, it threw, how far you threw it before it lands, uh, it's going to keep on rolling in the same direction. It doesn't really matter if you made note of that or not. In quantum mechanics, however, and in quantum computing, the measurement will actually alter the evolution of the quantum state. So if your state psi was in a happy superposition and then we decided to measure it, it would be what we call collapsing the superposition state to either the zero and the one. And remember, we can never directly measure a state to be in a superposition. We use this term collapse because we have no better word or terminology or description or picture for what is happening. This is referred to what we call the Copenhagen interpretation. And if you're not a fan of that, that's fine. There are other interpretations, and I apologize, but we're not going to get into that here. This interpretation is going to be sufficient for all the calculations that we're going to need to do in this course. And if you're curious, I definitely recommend and encourage you to research that further. The measurement part of quantum is also weird, not only because of this whole idea of state collapse, but because you can't perfectly measure all observables that you would like to at the exact same time. And this is because of the uncertainty relationship. And we already saw this when we talked about the stern gerlach experiment, because when we tried to measure the projection of the atoms along one axis and then the other, we weren't able to retrieve the information from the first measurement. And one way of writing that is the commutation relationship here with these square brackets of poly z and poly x. And that's represented by the sigma z and sigma x here. And this is equal to a to just not zero. It's not super important for right now what the commutation relationship is equal to, but it's just not equal to zero, which means that you can't perfectly measure the projection along z and then x. And uh, this is just as good as it gets in quantum mechanics, and that's part of the fun and, and part of what makes it so hard. All right, so now if we take a really quick look at time evolution here, you can see that if we let a certain state evolve here. We're just looking at the one, one, zero state, a three qubit state. When we're not interacting with it, you can see that it will naturally just evolve in time with the graph here that shows the probability of finding a certain state that we started with at a much later time. However, if we were actually going to go and perform a measurement uh, in this instance, this graph doesn't necessarily correspond to the time evolution on the left here. But you wouldn't have no way of knowing what the time evolution of that state was upon measuring. In fact, you would know nothing except what state it currently was when you measured it. In order to get a distribution or a histogram like I have made here for you in these different colors, you would have to run the experiment multiple times and then plot the distribution of the state that you retrieved at the very end every single time. So calculating this natural evolution can be really, really challenging. It's really the name of the game, finding how psi evolves in time. And that's where quantum computers and quantum simulation comes in. So the three main stages that we're gonna be discussing in the following lectures for quantum simulation are one, the, the state preparation, the quantum state preparation. So we need to be able to reliably put our state into a specific, um, into a specific state and we'd be able to do that again and again and again. 
we need to be able to let it evolve in time undisturbed. And there are a few methods by which to do this, which we will discuss. And then lastly, there's the measurement element, which will stop the natural time evolution and collapse the state into the classical values zero and one, which we will then try to make sense of and try to extract information from. Uh, okay, and that's all there is to it. That is the name of the game. All right, um, we're sort of wrapping up here. This is the very last part of the lecture. And with just a few more moments that I have here with you today, I want to quickly talk about the real world hardware that we're going to be experimenting on for the rest of the summer of school. All right, so this is the latest hardware development roadmap that IBM released just a few weeks ago. And you'll see that everything listed here um, on the bottom represents the size of the quantum processor in terms of the number of qubits. Um, everything is named after a bird. So you'll see here that uh, we are currently in 2022 on the Osprey. Um, and then in 2023, we have the Heron, the Condor. Uh, this is basically just because there are a lot of people at IBM who like birds. Um, and although the number of qubits is not like the only way to describe how good a processor is, it's certainly a part that counts for a lot. We also have a lot of ways of measuring the quantum volume and other factors, which will determine how good a processor is as well as we um, go forward in time. All right. But um, you can also see here last fall, it was really exciting that we de debuted Eagle, and this was the first chip with over uh, 100 qubits. It's an awesome milestone, um, and this is where we, we plan to head in the future to 2026 and beyond. And the fact that you can do quantum computing from anywhere now never ceases to you know really blow my mind we have real quantum processors they're on the cloud um, if you haven't yet you're going to need to go in to the ibm um, web page and make your ibm id and once you do this it's totally free it's really easy you can sign in you can learn about quantum computing there and you can see all of the quantum computers and all of the processors that you're going to have access to and you're going to be able to explore their connectivity and the gate fidelities and you know just how good every single qubit is online so we're going to be using this a lot later on in the week so if you haven't gone on and made an I, ibm id yet uh, do that at your your easiest and soonest convenience oh yeah and that's just a picture of, of what uh, one of the systems might look like when you log in so you can see the whole connectivity map all of the qubits that are available and then all of their specs as well one thing we haven't actually addressed yet is that there are actually many different types of physical qubit implementations. And a qubit, I know I told you just picture this block sphere. That's just a theoretical image, though. That's not what a qubit really looks like in real life. It just has to be something with two distinct energy levels and in a state that we can control. So, for instance, there are existing technologies for qubits in ion traps and defects in solids, semiconductor quantum dots, nano wires, and uh, topological insulators. Um, but here at IBM, we, we have a favorite. Um, so please meet the Transmon uh, superconducting qubit. We use superconducting qubits here in the lab, and that's the technology that you're going to be experimenting on later on in the week. All right. Um, so. This is what an older IBM quantum chip looks like. And at the heart of this technology and this superconducting qubit is this thing called the Josephson junction. And this is made in a nano fabrication process um, by basically taking a tiny little strip of superconductor and overlaying it with another strip of superconductor. And there exists a naturally growing oxide in the middle here in between them like a sandwich. So if you zoom in here really, really far, you can see that overlapping area. Um, with that yellow box here, that represents our Joseph's injunction. And that's sort of the magic element that we're going to discuss further in just a minute. And the qubit itself is made from putting, you know, not just the, the Joseph's injunction uh, in the nano fabrication facility, but it also makes two large um, conducting rectangles on either side of the junction here, which will couple to a resonator strip line. And the two transmons, or the two superconducting qubits, can talk to one another through um, a superconducting bus resonator, which again is, is, is a strip line. And this can carry information back and forth from one to the other. All right, let's delve a little bit more into what makes Joseph's injunctions so special now. 
So if we examine schematically what a typical circuit might look like here, this is just a capacitor in series, or sorry, in parallel with a linear inductor. Um, and you might know from any uh, classical physics class or a quantum mechanics class also that this is what the potential energy would look like from a simple harmonic oscillator. And so you can see that every single rung of this potential energy diagram is equally spaced from one another. And so this is actually not a qubit um, because there's no way to isolate any two energy levels on this potential energy diagram, right? They're all evenly spaced, so you can't just pick any two apart from one another. So what we have to do here is introduce a Josephson junction. And pictorially, we can describe it with a box with two uh, crosses through it like this. And like I said before, you can sort of picture it like a sandwich. It's a layer of superconductor, an insulator, and then another superconductor on the bottom. And current will flow across this insulating barrier in a nonlinear way, in a sinusoidal way, as described here. And this is the relationship for its energy, uh, if you're interested below. And so what this does is when you put it in a circuit, say we replace our linear inductor with the Josephson junction, it stretches our potential energy well in such a way that the rungs of the ladder are no longer equidistant from one another, right? So we can take the lowest two energy levels here, let's just call it the ground state and the excited state and isolate those with a specific pulse at that transition energy and call that um, our qubit. And that's why we love the Josephson junction. So we take now our qubits and we put them all together in our processor and everything is placed now at the bottom of this system here called a dilution refrigerator. And we'll take a little zoomed in picture of what that looks like on the next slide. It's sort of like a babushka Russian nesting doll, if you've seen one of those, where it's like a can and a can and a can, and every single inner can progressively gets colder and colder here. And so you can see that we would place the, um, the qubit processor all the way at the bottom here, where it's basically only 10 to 20 millikelvin. So it's incredibly, incredibly cold. And then to work on it, we have to warm it up to room temperature and take it all apart. And these are, this is a, an example of one of our excellent scientists, Michael, working on uh, the quantum computer in our lab here at IBM. Um, but because it's a superconductor, it's really, really important that we isolate it from the environment um, as much as possible and keep it really, really cold because superconductors don't superconduct unless it's at an extremely cold temperature. So now a little bit of a closer look here at the Dilfridge reveals some really cool and interesting engineering. And I'm not going to get into every single component here, but I just wanted to give you a quick snapshot. So the qubit signal travels down these input lines with these cryogenic isolators and circulators to uh, the bottom here where we have our quantum processor. It would go here at the very bottom, and then it would be amplified. That signal would be amplified with quantum amplifiers that also exist at this extremely low temperature. Um, it's protected by cryoperm shielding and also magnetic shielding as well to try and isolate it from the environment as much as possible. Because uh, as you might have predicted, quantum signals, qubits are very, very delicate and they really don't like to interact with any type of thermal noise, any noise really. Um, and so it's important to keep them as isolated from the environment as much as possible in order to get good fidelity and good measurement. All right, so how do we actually go about measuring one of these qubits? What's going to happen physically later on in the summer school when we're trying to interact with these devices? So in order to perform a measurement on the qubit, we never interact with it directly. Instead, we couple that qubit to a 2D or a 3D resonator. In this case, we're using 2D resonators like those strip lines that I showed you before. And this is in such a way that the qubit will have an effect on that resonator. And then we can see that effect by interacting with the resonator. All right. So in the dispersive regime, and what that means is that the qubit and the cavity are very far away from each other in terms of frequency, we'll be able to see a shift in the resonator's frequency depending on what state the qubit is in. So for example, if the uh, qubit is in the ground state or the excited state, this will affect the shift in the frequency of the resonator. So by measuring the in-phase or the quadrature phase component of a microwave signal tone, which sounds a little bit confusing, but I, it's just the same as measuring the imaginary part and then the real part, 
what we can do is we can send in a microwave tone to that resonator at that specific frequency and see it shift down if the qubit is in the uh, the excited state or up if it's in the round state. And so we'll be able to see that shift in frequency and therefore know what is going on with our qubit at the bottom of the, the dilution refrigerator. All right, so now let's examine how to actually read out these qubit signals at room temperature, because of course you can't crawl into the bottom of the dilution refrigerator when it's 15 millikelvin to take data. That would be not advisable. So at room temperature here at the beginning, we send a pulse of microwave light, just like I said, um, from a generator down into coax lines of the fridge, and the pulse will interact with the qubit in such a way that when it leaves the resonator, it will be shifted um, either down or up, depending on if that qubit state is in E or G. And you can also sort of plot this microwave tone in the IQ space or the imaginary and real space, like I said before, as a Gaussian blob where the distance would be um, a factor of n, the number of photons in that microwave tone. And you would be able to see that blob shift left or right. And they wouldn't actually turn red or blue. This is just, you know, a pictorial image. But you could see the blob shift depending on if that qubit state is E or G. And that's how we actually measure a qubit. All right. So now I have a fun little animation to show you here. We're wrapping up. So this is what would actually happen, right? So we have all these connectivity lines. You're going to go to your laptop later on. You're going to send in a measurement pulse or a gate. It's going to travel down to our room temperature electronics. It will be digitized into a waveform that the um, that will then travel down these input lines, travel through our resonators, interact with the qubit. It will interact with the resonator in such a way that it will transform that wave. It will come back up, be amplified, go through the control electronics at room temperature again, be digitized, and then it will, will tell us what state the qubit was in. All right? I know that went a little bit fast, but that's just an explanation um, and a visual image of what's going to be going on when we interact with these qubits later in the week. All right. So we are at my conclusion slide now and sort of my summary for the day. So in summary, understanding the rules of quantum mechanics and quantum computing is not particularly difficult. They are just simply unexpected. The applications, however, are difficult. And Dan Snyder has this really excellent analogy where he says, you know, we can write down all the rules of chess onto a single piece of paper, right? And even though it's just a single piece of paper, when you look at it, what this actually equals is 30 to the 80 possible chess moves, which is a number that's impossible to fully comprehend. But just for reference, there's only 10 to the 80 atoms in the entire observable universe. And very similarly, you can write down the rules of quantum mechanics onto a piece of paper, or maybe onto one slide for a summer school, just for example, and it doesn't seem that complicated. But when you put together all of these rules into certain combinations and strengths and forms, you're able to build up something incredible, which could have incredible applications for the future, such as quantum simulation. All right. Um, so these are some excellent resources that I used to help build up this lecture. I super recommend any of them um, for those looking to, to learn more about it further. All right, um, this is the end of my lecture for the day. So I will leave you with this quote by John Preskill, who is a very prominent scientist in quantum information. And I would be happy to take any questions if you have them. Thank you.